Welcome back to Lost Ancient Mysteries. In this video, we'll be continuing the overview of unique anomalies and mysterious ancient artifacts I saw while on tour in Egypt earlier this year. This video is part two of the Egypt tour overview. The link for part one is in the description below. We will wrap up the tour in part three. The day after we visited the Osirian at Abydos, details of that are in part one, we visited the Hathor temple at Dendera. This temple was one of my favorites out of all of the temples that we visited as far as artwork goes. The zodiac imagery on the ceiling of the temple is beautiful, and I was very curious to see the Dendera bulbs. This image is of the Sagittarius portion of the zodiac and also a stunning depiction of the goddess Newt. This famous image that's also on the ceiling of the Hathor temple is full of symbolism, as is most of the temple. The round disc at the right side of this image, according to one of our guides, is the Mirror of Hathor, and it's holding the Eye of Horus, showing the sun and the moon together symbolically, which also represents the union of the Divine Feminine and Masculine while in perfect balance. Horus is the son of Osiris and Isis, and Hathor is the wife of Horus. There are 14 figures on the steps leading up to the mirror. There is dual symbolism in that number, according to our guide. They said that the 14 figures represent the 14 pieces that Osiris was cut into after being killed by Seth, which Isis then searched all of Egypt to find the 14 pieces of her partner to put him back together. The other symbolic meaning that our guide mentioned was that if you double the number 14, you get 28, which is the number of days in the lunar cycle. To see the Dendera bulbs, you have to crawl through a small tunnel, and the bulbs are at the end of one of two hallways beyond that tunnel. There are three bulbs in total. These two are on the right side of the hallway, and the third is directly across them on the left. There are multiple theories about what these images depict, some stating that they are actual light bulbs showing the Egyptians having electricity, and other theories that believe the imagery is entirely symbolic. Our guides leaned towards the theories on symbolism, and even then, there wasn't full consensus. The primary theory that our guides favored was that each bulb represents a trimester of pregnancy, showing symbolism for a part of the soul, or the ka, as the ancient Egyptians called it, coming into form as the fetus is born. The symbology that our guides explained is this. The lotus at the base of the bulb represents feminine energy. The filament which is shown as a snake coming out of the lotus flower represents coming into consciousness. Then the bulb encasing that consciousness is symbolizing the conception itself. And the jet pillar below the bulb is preparing the soul to come into form. The jet pillar is shown with the arms outside of the bulb in the second trimester image, holding it up from the outside of the container. And the bulb that represents the third trimester shows the arms of the jet pillar inside of the container which our guide said symbolizes the jed pillar raising the level of consciousness of the fetus to prepare it to be born. Also, in the third trimester bulb, you see the birth process represented below it. The two goddesses facing each other represent duality, and that the soul is entering into our zone of duality. The seated woman is in a birthing chair representing the actual birth of the fetus itself. At the end of the third bulb, there is an anthropomorphic figure with two objects in its hands. Our guides explained that this is a genie and said that it's a protector for the soul as it comes into the world. I don't have a better image of the genie figure, I am sorry. My other images that were straight on of the bulb cut off the genie. It was a very narrow hallway and there were many of us crowded into the small space. So my image is not as great as it could be, and nobody else in the group that I have talked to since then has found a clearer image. This is just one of many theories. Our guides all had different theories, but they were mostly in line with this one, or at least represented the soul coming into consciousness. One of our other guides did have a theory, though, that resonated with the light bulb one more. He said that the lotus is often symbolized with sunlight, and the container of the bulb is holding the light that's coming out of the lotus. I believe there's dual symbolism being shown here. I think it could represent light bulbs, but also showing some symbology of how energy may have been viewed as a soul itself, and that maybe they added pregnancy symbolism since the soul comes into being through pregnancy like electricity causing light to come into being. But that's just my theory based off of the two combined theories. What are your thoughts? 
We also visited the Ramesseum, which is the mortuary temple of Ramses II, also known as Ramses the Great, who is believed by many to be the pharaoh from the infamous Moses Exodus story, which comes from the Abrahamic religions of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. This immense statue was intentionally knocked over by later Egyptians so that they could break it apart to reuse it in other structures or statues, according to our guide, who is a stonemason. He said that it is far easier to repurpose a stone that has already been cut and quarried than to start entirely from scratch. And that logically made sense to me. Evidence of reuse of materials could be seen at almost every site that we went to in Egypt. You can see evidence of the intention for reuse in the large saw mark that cuts across the statue's head in this image. I personally believe this saw mark was made using a straight saw and sand under the blade for added abrasion over the course of several days due to the warbling that you can see along the saw line. It is not a perfectly straight line. Mainstream archaeology is very fond of the sand abrasion method and attribute it as the primary sawing method, if not the only sawing method, used by the ancient Egyptians. I will go into detail and provide more comparisons on different saw marks and cutting methods in later videos. Here is the same saw cut from a different angle. Another reason I believe this saw mark was cut slowly and using sand for abrasion is due to the rounding at the top of the saw mark. Weather erosion can cause this too, but Egypt and the Sahara Desert have been arid for the last 6,000 years according to geological record. And if this was carved during the reign of Ramses II, then it is roughly 3,000 years old, meaning it would have to be attributed to wind erosion, but I didn't notice the same sandblasted look on many other parts of the statue. A more detailed analysis is needed. Here's a comparison of this saw mark to the image of the basalt stone at the Giza Plateau with a saw cut in it that I shared in part one. I've rotated the basalt image so that the saw cuts are parallel to make the comparison easier. There is a clear difference in the straightness of the saw cut in the basalt stone compared to the giant statue, which was made of granite. Granite and basalt are both a 6 on the Mohs scale of hardness, so this is an accurate comparison of how a saw can cut into the stone. The primary variable here is what type of saw was used. I see distinct warbling in the saw line of the giant statue, but a straight, precise cut in the basalt stone. So I personally believe that these two cuts were made with two different types of saws. One was a circular saw spinning rapidly. The other was likely a straight saw and appears to have been cut more slowly. We also visited the Karnak Temple Complex. Karnak is not one large temple. It is a complex of multiple temples and requires at least an entire day to see. It is huge. For my U.S. viewers, that perimeter measurement in miles is roughly two and a half miles, and the area is half of a square mile, and it is packed full of hieroglyphs, columns, and obelisks. This statue of a ram was one of many lining the entrance of the Karnak Temple complex. There were several people in the group who were theorizing on the possible age of the Karnak Temple complex because of the zodiac ages. As I do more research, I'm learning that it is common throughout history for cultures to use symbolism during certain epochs or ages of time. For this example, the age of the ram or the age of Aries was from 2200 BC to 100 BC or BCE. This zodiac age date range lines up perfectly with the mainstream archaeological community, which believes the construction of Karnak began just after 2000 BC. Karnak is famous for its multiple, immense columns and obelisks. These columns are part of the Great Hypostyle Hall, which consists of 134 columns arranged into 16 rows with the largest columns down the center aisle. These are the larger central columns. The word hypostyle means under columns, and the area itself is 5,000 square meters, or 54,000 square feet in size. This piece of an obelisk is famously known for ringing like a bell when it's struck. The tone in which it rings or reverberates depends on what you hit it with, how hard, and where on the obelisk you strike. The authorities and archaeology teams had it fenced off, so I wasn't able to test it out, but that's probably a good thing. I can't even imagine the damage that this has taken over time, although it would have been awesome to try that out. 
this rock is a mystery to our geologist guide and to many other geologists who have studied it. This piece is part of the door lentil for the room of the temple that it still resides in and is likely made from diorite. All sides of this stone have been flash crystallized, according to our guide. The part in between her fingers has a different crystalline structure than the inner portion of the rock, and the geologists cannot figure out what would have caused that. One theory from prominent researcher Brian Forrester, who was going to be one of our guides for this trip, but external circumstances didn't allow him to come, unfortunately, is that this flash crystallization could have been caused from a solar flare, and then the stone was immediately submerged into water after the flare creating the flash crystallization effect. She also said that there are other statues in the area that exhibit this same phenomenon of flash crystallization and that research is starting to be done on those statues. So I hope to post a later video with an update on the conclusions of that research. What are your thoughts on this rock? I would love to hear your theories as well. Large portions inside of Karnak were just rows upon rows of temple pieces that haven't been put back together yet, just on display in what are called open-air museums. These open-air museums were common at various sites that we visited in Egypt. I will create a more in-depth video for Karnak later because there is just too much to put into this one video without it becoming too long. This giant hand was displayed in the largest of the Karnak open-air museums, and only the thumb is visible because the fingers are gripping the object that the hand is holding, so the hand is making a fist. The craftsmanship on this piece was fantastic, and the group spent several minutes admiring just this one statue fragment. Aside from showing no tooling marks of any kind, it also had cuticles. Many of the statues in Egypt have cuticles, and we all just admired the attention to detail. The color pattern in the stone was also stunning. Our stonemason guide led us down several aisles of the largest open-air museum in Karnak to find these tube drill remnants. In this image, the core of the tube drill was not fully broken off, leaving us with a beautiful granite core still in place that allows us to see the drilling marks on the core itself. Tube drilling is a process used by the ancient Egyptians where they wore a copper tube into stone with an abrasive agent then remove the tube and break apart the core, removing the material. These images better show that process and come from pages 306 and 324 of Lost Technology of Ancient Egypt by Christopher Dunn. If you don't already have a copy of this book, I highly recommend it. Here is a close-up of the drill marks on that core that still remains in place. Some tube drill samples show consistent spacing between each groove, which means the speed at which the tube drill spun and the pressure exerted on the rock never changed. Lost Technology of Ancient Egypt describes one of the primary theories explaining this phenomenon, originally theorized by Flinders Petrie, and it involved oscillation. I am glad I got to see the Valley of the Kings as well. It is a famous burial place of royalty in the New Kingdom, which spanned from 1500 BC to 1070 BC. This is where Pharaoh Tutankhamun, or King Tut, was found buried in 1922. Since the tombs in the Valley of the Kings were all underground and were sealed, the paint colors in many of them have been impeccably preserved. This image and the one before it are both from the tomb of Ramses I, the founding pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. He was also the father of Seti I, for those who watched my previous video and the grandfather of Ramses II, whose mortuary temple was the Ramesseum, shown earlier in this video. The Temple of Edfu had a lot of Horus imagery, and I love the Horus statues lining the entryways of the temple. The hieroglyphs and murals in this temple, according to our guides, tell the story of light overcoming dark, the triumph of good over evil, and I've also heard there is a potential reference to Atlantis at this temple but I didn't learn about that connection until I returned home from the trip, so I don't have any imagery for that in this video. But you know I will be looking that up. This image is of two Jed pillars. If this looks familiar, there were also Jed pillars in the Dendera bulb photos at the beginning of this video. Pause and go back for reference to see the comparisons if interested. The Jed pillar is primarily associated with the themes of rebirth, regeneration, and stability, and is associated with Osiris, the father of Horus. 
This boat image is part of the mural depicting the story of good overcoming evil. One of the most important aspects of this image that one of our guides pointed out is that Isis is the woman sitting at the front of the boat. This is significant because not only is this potentially the first time a woman was depicted leading a boat, she is also taking her place as the Widow Queen again after her son Horus defeated the god of chaos Set or Seth, who killed his father Osiris. The twin temple at Komombo was unique. It was the only twin temple we saw in Egypt during our tour. One of the twin temples is dedicated to Sobek, the crocodile god, and the other is dedicated to Horus. This temple is also where a birthing hieroglyph is found. The baby is blackened from touching because it is common for women to come here to pray in hopes of becoming pregnant. Seeing the mummified crocodiles in the Crocodile Museum of Komombo was also fascinating. There were multiple whole crocodile mummies lined up at the entrance and facing you when you walk in. It made for a dramatic entrance. Some still had pieces of their cloth wrappings around their bodies. And there were also crocodile eggs and baby crocodiles on display. A few of us chose to take an extra excursion out to the relocated temples of Abu Simbel. This entire temple hill site and the sister temple next to it were both moved in the 1960s to preserve them due to the Aswan High Dam being constructed, which caused their original site locations to be flooded by the dam's reservoir. Since the temples were carved out of solid sandstone bedrock, they had to be cut into pieces in order to be moved and reassembled. When the temples were reassembled, they were reconstructed exactly as they had been before they were moved, including the orientation of the temples so that the sun would still hit the entry at the exact same angle and illuminate the inside of the temple twice a year. That is also why one of the four statues of the larger temple were left broken instead of being reconstructed in his original seated position. This temple is claimed to have been built by none other than Ramses II. And the four figures of him that line the front of the temple are nearly 70 feet tall. This is the front facade of the smaller sister temple believed to have been built by Ramses II for his wife Nefertari. What is unique about the front facade of this temple is that Nefertari is shown as being the same size as Ramses. Usually, the queens were depicted with smaller statues in the pharaohs, so this is seen as an important tribute to her and her status. I value symbolism and signs, and Horus is one of the Egyptian gods that resonates with me the most. Maybe it's just because I like birds and have a particular liking to hawks or falcons, but it really struck me, and one of our guides that I was walking with, when we saw a hawk fly overhead right as we entered the temple, considering there is a carving of Horus at the temple entryway. He was a beautiful bird too. I'm thankful that I got a shot of him as he flew overhead. I had to share this story and these images for my viewers who believe in symbology and signs, particularly nature symbolism. I don't see a lot of images online showing the inside of the two temples at Abu Simbel, but Ramses' temple had several of these figures lining the center of the first room that you enter, and Nefertari's temple was lined with Hathor imagery, as well as imagery of Nefertari herself. Abu Simbel is in the Nubian area, and she definitely appears Nubian in this image. Nefertari means beautiful companion, and she is beautiful. There were also smaller rooms that branched out from the main rooms in both temples that were filled with hieroglyphs and ritual imagery. One image that caught my attention the most was this one because it is unfinished. This is at the end of the hall that it was in, and the carving stopped about midway through the image, leaving the right side completely uncarved and still lined in the charcoal that they used to trace out the images before carving. I am just assuming that is charcoal because I don't have a sample kit and... Of course, I was not authorized to take samples. Another temple site that had to be moved due to the building of the Aswan Dam is the Temple of Philae, which was relocated in 1971. The Temple of Philae was built later in Egyptian history, during the time of Ptolemy II in the Greco-Roman period of Egyptian history. Construction is believed to have been started around 280 BC. The temple is dedicated to Isis, Osiris, and their son Horus. The artwork of the columns was one of my favorite aspects of this temple. Some were very basic and had no hieroglyphs like these, 
but others were very complex and were in close proximity, if not right next to, the ones that were plain. It made for an interesting contrast, and I wonder if the simpler ones had been painted instead of carved. Our guides also took us to see the last known hieroglyphs ever carved. The marked decline in quality shows that the era of hieroglyphs was ending, and it was sad to see. Philae, due to border changes from the Roman Empire, remained one of the last temples of the ancient Egyptian religion, and these hieroglyphs were believed to have been carved in 394 AD. One temple site that resonated strongly with me was Elephantine Island. Due to its southern border location, Elephantine Island was a strategic trading post, administrative center, and later a fortress. What hit me the most were the layers upon layers of history at this site. You can see it just in the immense amount of pottery in situ, or still in the soil layers. Most of what you see in this image is ceramic pottery, not rocks. Here is me standing next to a wall of the in situ pottery. I was just floored by how much pottery I was walking on and how large and intricate some of the pieces were. I felt terrible walking on it and did my best not to break any, but it was impossible to avoid the pieces. And then, on top of the overwhelming amounts of pottery and mud brick temple structures, you had these megalithic single-piece carved objects strewn about as if they were knocked over in some cataclysm. And I personally believe that they were. Our guides believed the pieces were primarily knocked over with the intention of cutting them down for further reeves. This one shows evidence of damage amid its perfectly precision carved surface and other pieces clearly showed signs of reuse. So I'm open to the idea that both theories are correct. And here's me standing next to it for scale. This was just one of many immense granite structures scattered across the island. There was a rounded accent feature that runs along what was the top of the piece a few inches below the pyramidal roof. The perfectly smooth and evenly sized beveled edges of this accent feature are phenomenal. This shows machining to me and to our stonemason guide. Here is a photo from farther up on that accent piece. They were in the process of smoothing or rounding off those beveled edges and you can see the transition point about midway up the photograph. Our stonemason guide told us that they cut the striations or beveled lines first then used another tool to smooth out the edges to create the perfectly rounded surface. And in my next video, I'll wrap up my tour of Egypt in part three, which will include a visit to the Aswan Quarry and the unfinished obelisk, a visit to Fayum to see the most precisely carved box found in Egypt so far, and a more extensive visit to the Giza Plateau, where I went inside the Osiris Shaft, touched the Sphinx, and went inside the Great Pyramid, so stay tuned.